I can do more. I can use you. I can do more with you. I know you don't consider yourself a lot, but guess what? I'm going to use you, and I do more with less. That's right. I was like, wow. Wow, that's great. Well, praise the Lord. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, how many know that God calls men to preach? That man can't call man to preach. A man can't look at you and say, I, I, I'm saying you're going to be a preacher. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't matter if you go to college and you get a degree in theology that doesn't make you a preacher. God makes somebody a preacher. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And um, I remember when God was calling me. They always tell me, make sure, be sure of your calling. Make sure it was God calling you. Because you don't want to, you don't want to invest your whole life in, in preaching. And, you, and God really didn't call you. It was something of the flesh. It was of yourself. But I remember when God started calling me, after I truly got saved, I mean, I was in church for a long time, but after I got saved, God began just waking me up in the middle of the night just with sermons. I mean, I remember laying in bed just preaching sermons, and I was like blown away because I was like, where is this revelation coming from? Like, I knew it wasn't me. I remember waking up, quoting scripture, like I have a dead sleep. I'd wake up out of, out of sleep, and scripture would be on my tongue just coming out of it. And I knew God was calling me. And at the time, I had my grandmother living with us. And she was paralyzed. And I had just started doing this. And I didn't preach yet. And I said, I, I really want my grandmother to hear me preach. And I, I, want, I want my first sermon to be for her. I want my first sermon to be for her. You know, she, uh, she, she didn't... She didn't ever get to hear me preach. I, I, but I did put a sermon together for her. I remember studying and writing it out. And I wanted her to, I wanted her to be proud of what our grandson became. I wanted her to realize what a man of God, what God did in my life. And I wanted her to hear the true word of God. Because she, she had been in Catholic religion her whole life. And I wanted her to hear a true word. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so the message I had prepared for her years ago was the one I'm going to preach to you all today. Amen. Amen. And I've entitled it, Life After Death. Life After Death. Now, if you're a Christian, you don't believe in reincarnation. You believe what the Bible says. The Bible says it's pointed once a man to die and then the judgment. It doesn't say you die and die and die and die and die. You, you live once and then you, you face God. That's it. We believe that our mother delivered us into this world. We believe that we were born with a sin nature, which we inherited from Adam. We believe that we were hopeless and helpless without, without a Savior. Uh, one who was without sin, who would take our place, which Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. We believe after death there is eternal life. That there's more after this. And Jesus proved the resurrection. He proved it by his resurrection. He proved that. When he rose from the dead, he was making a statement. There is life after death. But that's not the death and life I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about life after dying physically. I'm talking about life after dying to yourself. There's an abundant life that Jesus promised us that I'm not seeing many Christians live. Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I've come that you may have life. That's right. And have it to the full. Christians must be living this abundant life, this life. He didn't just say, I'm going to give you life. He said, I'm going to give you a life that's bigger than life. It's going to, you've got to be contain it. And I'm not seeing Christians possess this life. I see too many Christians losing the fight on sin. Living in bondage to sin as if it was still their master. They're not experiencing the victory that Jesus paid for on the cross. And it hurts my heart to see my brothers and my sisters in bondage when I know there's more for you. And that's because there's another cross. When, you, when I was writing this, I was like, I could just hear people now that would be like, wait, wait, what are you talking about? No, there's only one cross, right? No, you're right. There's only one cross for salvation. 
We believe there was only one spotless lamb of God. We believe there was only only one way to, to, to God, right? Uh, from the day it said it, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There's only one way to God, and it's through the cross of Christ. Yes, there's only one way to salvation. But I'm not talking about the cross at all for salvation. There are many people who are saved, but yet they're bound. I'm talking about a different cross. And it's not the cross we wear on our necks, which I'm not against. I'm not against that at all. Or the tattoos of crosses that we have on our bodies. And it's not the crosses that we have stuck on the back of our car saying, hey, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Hmm, that's good. None of those things set you free. That's right. None of these things make you a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of them offer you freedom. No, the cross that makes you a follower, the cross that makes you a disciple is your own. Yeah. Hmm. Now listen, I, I don't. this message is not a message where people are going to be shouting and jumping for joy. But I promise you that this message offers freedom. Yeah. Oh, right. There's another cross, and it's our own. Matthew 16, 21-26. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross That's right. and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Yeah. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? <laughs> Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I pray that when I speak the scriptures, I pray the scripture speaks to you. I pray that the scripture speaks to you more than I speak to you. I pray that God's word would just, just invade you and flood you right now. Because a lot of times, and it happens to me, we, we read scripture and then we think, okay, now i got to start speaking about it. No, sometimes we need to just let the scripture just speak. God's word is powerful. Jesus said, unless you pick up your cross, you're not my father. He didn't say, if you just believe in my cross. He didn't say, if you go to church. He, did. he said, if you want to be my disciple, you must. Not you should, but you must. Deny yourself and take up your cross. And then follow me. See, a lot of times we only do one third of that. A lot of times we want to follow Jesus, but we don't want to deny ourselves. A lot of times we want to follow Jesus, but we don't want that cross. That's not going to cut it. That's not the way. That's not the way to freedom, and that's not the cross we like to talk about. That's not the cross that's preached. Pastor Leonard Ravenhill, one of my favorite pastors, he said in America, the churches are preaching a crossless, costless gospel, and he wasn't talking about the cross of Christ. He was talking about the believer's cross. Yeah. They don't want. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that there's a real cost to following Jesus. But there is. You see, as Christians, we follow Jesus anywhere. I'll follow Jesus to church. I'll follow Jesus to Bible study. I'll follow Jesus to, to outreach in the community. I'll go on missions trip for Jesus. I'll do all these things for Jesus. But the one place most believers won't go is to the cross. That's right. I'm not talking about Jesus' cross. I'm talking about our cross. That's the one place most believers won't go. And as I was putting this together, I was thinking to myself, think about the disciples. I mean, for three years, they were willing to do anything for Jesus, go anywhere for Jesus, preach for Jesus. They were willing to baptize for Jesus. They were doing all these things. But where's the one place they wouldn't go? Except for John, the cross. Not because they didn't want to see Jesus on the cross because it was a terrible sight. No, because they were afraid that they might have to get on the cross themselves. Yeah. And that's us. We'll do. We'll follow Jesus. We'll follow you anywhere. 
We'll do anything for you. He says, well, die for me. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. But, but I'll, I'll stand outside, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll feed the poor, and I'll go to another country for you. He says, well, just deny yourself. No, I'm not going to do that. What else do you have? He says, you're not even my disciple if you haven't done this. And the truth is, not only did they not want to give up their lives, they didn't want Jesus to give up his either. Remember, Peter was rebuking them. This shall never happen to you. They wanted Jesus to be king right then and there. They didn't want a Savior who was going to go to the cross and die and suffer. They wanted him to be king. I'm going to keep on saying, we're going to force you to be king. We're going to make you, make you king. Jesus was trying to explain to them first the cross, then the crown. That if there's no cross, there's no victory. You see, first the crucifix, and then the resurrection. And there's no resurrection if there's no death. But you see, death isn't the goal of the cross. Life is. Yeah. Yeah. The cross was never meant to, to kill Jesus and put him away. The cross was meant to, to offer us life. He told them, I'm going to die. He said, but three days later, I'm going to be raised to life. And then he tells them, now you pick up your cross and follow me. You see, we want to live this resurrection life, but that comes after, not before the crucified life. We want the victory. Victory over sin, temptation, bondage, fear, anxiety, depression, lust, hate, anger, addictions. But I'm here to tell you, if there's no cross, there's no crown. You will never experience victory if you don't first experiment being crucified. You cannot expect to walk in new life if you're still living out your old one. If you want to live in the freedom that Christ paid for on the cross of Calvary, it's very simple. You have to die. Yeah. But don't be afraid because I'm here to tell you there's life after death. There's life after death. A lot of times when we hear messages about following Jesus, Satan starts to tell you, you're going to give up your life? Oh, don't do that. You can't give up those things. That, that Christian life, that's, that's a life of being bored. No. That's a life of freedom. Yes. Right. Yes. I'm telling you now, do not be afraid to give up your life. And I'm not talking about your physical life. I'm talking about dying to yourself. Because when you die to yourself, you can live for Christ. When you die, Christ lives. That's the only way. Two people can't live in your body at the same time. It's either you or it's Jesus. It's either bondage or it's freedom. But you have to decide. I want to show you three people. I wasn't even going to put this in there, but it just spoke to me. I want to show you Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Jewish boys who refused to bow to the idol set up by King Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. I want to show you this. I'm telling you, it spoke to me, and I pray it speaks to you. Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 through 25, it says this. They said, if that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. They said, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods. Amen. Nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, 
Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True. Look, he answered, now I see four men. They're loose. Walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Yeah. Wow. Come on, yes. brother. Yes. Come on. Yes, Lord. You see, it says that Nebuchadnezzar had mighty men. In the NIV, he tells some of his strongest soldiers, bind them up. And that's what Satan tries to do to us. He tries to intimidate us with death and make us bow to idols. But see, I can't bow to an idol. I already bowed to the king. <laughs> These three boys would only worship God. And this is exactly the way it is with most believers. You see, we say, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm going to follow Jesus. And Satan has some of his strongest, mighty men who are in his army to try to bound, bind you up, to try, to try to put chains on you, to try to keep you. And God says, don't worry about it. Jump in the fire, I got you. Just take up your cross, I have you. And the very thing that was meant to kill them was the very thing that set them free. Oh, my God. That cross is not meant to kill you. It's meant to loose you. Yes. The only thing you lose when you follow Jesus is your chains. Yes. The only thing you lose is your bondage, your life of sin. Don't listen to that devil when he tries to make you afraid. Jesus is already, is already, already there. Come on. Follow him. Come on. Yes. There's life after death. There's life after death. There's a song I write down and it says, and it speaks to me. It says, the cross that was meant to kill is my victory. Come on. Yes, indeed. That cross, what was, what was meant to kill me, was meant to kill Jesus, actually gave him victory, and now I have victory because I decided to take up my cross. Because I said, I'm going to follow you. Not to church, but to death. Because I know there's life after death. Oh, man. And I'm not afraid of my life. Come on. Come on. And I'm telling you, if you're tired of being a slave of sin, and you're tired of being a slave to addiction, then this message is for you. There's a quote I read from the movie Spartacus. Kirk Douglas said this. He said, when a free man dies, he loses the pleasures of life. He said, a slave loses his pain. Yeah. Death is the only freedom a slave knows. And that's why he's not afraid of it. That's why we win. You see, I'm not afraid to give up my life. But before Jesus, I was a slave. Yes. Yeah. I'm not afraid to lay it down. That's the only way I can get free, Jesus said. If I take up my cross. I'm not afraid. And because I'm not afraid to take up my cross, I'm going to win. Come on. Yeah. I'm going to win this fight. Yeah. You can't hold on to your life. Jesus said if you hold on to it, you're going to lose it. Yeah. He said if you try to hold on to it, you're going to lose it. He said, but if you lose it, yeah. then you'll find it. Yeah. If you want life, you want abundant life? Yeah. You better lay the first one down. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid to lay the old life down. What did it get you? Right. Yeah. What did it got you in bondage? Right. What did it brought you hurt? Pain? Man, lay that old funky thing down and take up the new life. Come on. Yeah. 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 Jesus said, anybody who sins is a slave to sin. Yeah. And I know what that's like. After I was saved, I was still sinning. Even though I wanted to quit, that's when you realize that everything you thought you had actually had you. You think you have sin because while you're doing it, you're loving it. Well, I tell you, try and stop and see if you have it or it has you. You're a slave. I don't want to be a slave to sin. I want to be a slave of righteousness. I'm not a slave of Satan. I'm a slave, of the son, a slave to the Son of God. I wanted freedom. And I knew I needed something more than just going to church. Paul addressed this, Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And he gave himself to me. There's your answer. Mm -hmm. I has to die. Right. I no longer live. 
I have no right to those things no more because I don't belong to me anymore. The Bible says I was bought at a price. Somebody else bought me. You see, I was on a slave block being sold off to sin when Jesus stepped up and said, I'll take him. Jesus said, I'll take him. How much are you going to pay? I'll give my life for him. I'll give my life for him. I'm a slave to God. I don't belong to me anymore. I don't have any right. I don't have any rights to sin in this body. It doesn't belong to me. It was bought. I'm blood bought. Paul laid down his life so that Christ could live through him. This is the crucified life. A life dead to your old self and alive to God. No longer slaves of sin and destruction. Remember being a slave to sin and destruction? Everything you touch, you destroy. I'm a slave of righteousness. A slave doesn't mind death because it means freedom. Me and Matt were talking. That's really where I started getting a lot of this. We were riding and Matt was telling me he was doing a, a study on, on slavery. I said, Matt, I said, how, how would a slave get free? He said, well, one of the ways is if his master died. And it was like, ding, ding, ding. That's it. That's it. If we want to get free, our master has to die. And our master, I'm telling you, is us. Yes. Yeah. We have got to lay down our lives. Yes. Let's look at Romans 6. I, I'm telling you, when I speak the script, let the, let the scripture speak to you. Verse 6. It says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Yeah. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Hallelujah. Yeah. Check it out. Because anyone who has died has been yeah. set free from sin. Come on. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, that means just like Jesus died, in the same way, that's what you're going to have to do. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from what? From death to life. There's life after death. And offer every part of yourselves to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall no longer be your master if you die. Verse 7, I love it. It says, because anyone who has died has been set free. There's your answer right there. Why am I not experiencing freedom? Why am I not walking in the freedom that Jesus paid for? Because you haven't died yet. Because you haven't died yet. So how does one become crucified like Paul said in Galatians chapter 2? How does a believer lay down his life? Let's look at the scripture and see what Jesus said when he mentioned picking up the cross. Let's look at the first one in Matthew. Matthew 16, 21. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders the chief priest and the teacher of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The first thing Jesus addressed was Peter's mindset. He told him you have an earthly mindset, not a heavenly one. And we have to address this issue. Your mind is your thoughts, your focus, your desires. We have to become kingdom-minded people. Yes. Yes. Thinking about the kingdom of God. I dream about the kingdom of God. I wake up thinking, how am I going to advance God's kingdom? Not my own anymore. 
So I seek His kingdom first. See, we're either seeking God's kingdom or our own. We're either building God's kingdom or we're building our own. And really, we're destroying our own, if you really think about it. We're either living for Him and His kingdom or ours. The question is, what are you focused on? Colossians 3, 2 through 3 says this. It says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you die. There it is again. And your life is now hidden with Christ and God. The Greek word for set, when it says set your mind, it means to seek something out with a desire to possess it. I, 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 I set my mind on heaven because I'm, I'm after it. Because right. I'm going to possess it. I'm determined. I'm going after it. Yeah. Everything in this world, everything I see in the grave, it just slips through my hands. I'm going to something that I can't lose. I'm going to the kingdom. I, I'm, my mind is set. Yeah. Like a runner competing for a prize, there's only one thing he thinks about, and that's the finish line. There are some people who run the races like the like the, uh, the Zerg Classic, whatever it is, Preston City Classic. They didn't go out there just to play around. They go out there to run, look at the scenery. But then they got those guys on the front line, and as soon as that thing starts, they're going. They not don't distract me. I don't need anything right now. I don't care how beautiful the house is along the way. My mind is set. That's what we have to do. We have to set our minds on God's kingdom. Determined to possess it and not let anything distract us or get in our way. No, I'm going. I'm running for something. Yeah. I'm running for a prize. Either we have a temporary mindset or an eternal one. And we have to get out of our minds and get the mind of Christ. First right. yeah. Corinthians two sixteen says, But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Next, Jesus says, is you have to deny yourself. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. And Philippians chapter 2, 3 through 7 says this. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not look into your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the other. And your relationship with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. We have to consider others better than ourselves. That's what it means to deny yourself. When I come here, I consider myself to be the least. I put my brothers and my sisters before me. This is a selfless life, not a selfish life. There's no, the Bible says there's no greater love than a man who wants to lay down his life for his friends. I was talking to Chad about that. If you want to see your family get saved, if you want to see your friends get saved, then you have to be willing to lay down your life. Just like Jesus laid down his life so that we can have, have salvation, we have got to be willing to lay down our lives. And Jesus said, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. Are we single seeds living for ourselves, putting ourselves first, or have we died to selfishness and become, as Romans 12, 1 says, a living sacrifice? Are we a single seed, me and me alone, all I care about is myself, or was I willing to lay my life down, like you throw a seed in the ground, was I willing to lay my life down and die so that other people can live? Have you denied yourself? The Lord asked me that question. I put it, put it, put it, was writing this down. He said, what did you have to deny yourself of? I said, wow. We have to ask ourselves these questions. When you read this Bible, you, you have to read it and then let it speak to you. Let it talk to you. If I'm going to be a follower, I can deny myself. Don't just go over there. Ask yourself, what did I deny myself of? How did I deny myself in this world? In, in Mark, I was thinking about this. There was a time, and it's a perfect example of, of what we're supposed to do. There was a time when Jesus and his disciples, they were tired and they were hungry. And he told them, he said, look, let's get away to a quiet place. Let's go eat and get some rest. And they get in a boat, and when they get to the other side, they realize there's people there waiting for them. And Jesus didn't run them off. Even though he was tired, 
He started teaching. And then he says, I'm going to feed him. He tells his disciples, he says, get some food for him, which they didn't have. And then once they get the food through a miracle, he makes them disperse it. Now, they could have very easily said, but I'm tired. I'm hungry myself. He was showing them, you are going to have to deny yourself. Yeah, I know you're tired. I know you're hungry, but remember, you died. You have to deny yourself. Yeah. There's been times where I'm laying in bed four in the morning, and I'll get a phone call from a friend of mine. Hey, man, I really need you. My girlfriend, she's having anxiety with bed. I'm outside the house. I need you to pray for me. I could have said, I mean, I'm tired. Come back tomorrow. No. Deny yourself, son. Get out of bed. Somebody needs you. Get out of bed. That's why I'm at every church service. Every Bible study. Every Monday night. Why? Because it's about me? Because I, because I, need, I need something? No. Because it's about everybody else. Because somebody might be there that might need you. Somebody might be there that needs you to pray with them. Somebody might be there that might need a word from you. Might need comfort from you. Remember, we have to deny ourselves. This isn't about us. When you decide to follow Jesus, you said it's not about me. It's about everybody else. That's right. This is about souls. This is about salvation. This is about the people that Jesus died for. Yeah. The next thing he says is, in verse 24, And Jesus said to the disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Now, people misunderstand what, 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 what people mean by that, what Jesus meant by that. When he said, take up your cross, you hear it all the time. Yeah, we all have a cross to bear. That's not what he meant. People think you have a cross to bear. It's like something you have to just put up with and deal with. That's not what he meant. When he said, take up your cross, that meant death. The cross meant being crucified. When you saw a man carrying his cross, you know that was it. He wasn't coming back. The man made a decision. He was going to, he was going to die. So what is it that we have to crucify? Galatians 5.24 says this, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh yeah. with its passions and desires. The flesh has to be crucified. But what is your flesh? What is your flesh? Simply put, it's your sinful nature. It's our natural desire to sin. It produces only wickedness and unrighteousness. It's that part of you that's opposite of God. It's that part of you that's rebellious. It's that part of you that says, yeah, I know God wants this, but I'm going to do that. It's that selfish part of you. That's the flesh. It's that part that says, yeah, I know Jesus said not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's the flesh. It's the sinfulness that we inherited from Adam. It has to be crucified. I hope I'm not losing y'all. Yeah. How do we crucify the flesh? Romans 6, 12 said this. It says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. You crucify it by denying it. That's how you crucify it. When that old sin nature calls, when it tries to get you to do something, you deny it. But it's painful. I know it's painful. So is the cross. All right. That's why he said, take up your cross. Yeah. It ain't a joke. That's right. It's going to hurt That's denying right. yourself. It's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. But you have to do it. Yeah. See, it says, therefore do not, which means you have a choice. You, cannot no, you can no longer say that sin has control of me. No. After what Jesus did on the cross, no. You now have a choice. You can choose to or not to sin. A believer cannot say, I can't stop sinning. He simply has to say, I won't stop. That's right. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. that was yes, we still feel the temptations. But we're not in their power. Our days of slavery are ended. They're over. Yeah. Yes. And yes, the flesh is still going to try to tell you what to do. Donald Gray Barnhouse said this. He used to give an analogy to explain. He, he told of a crew whose captain went mad and was replaced in mid-voyage by the first mate. I want you to get this. Now, the old captain had no authority 
The new captain was the one to be obeyed. Yet Bowen House suggested that the crew might very well find itself jumping to obey when the old captain shouted out his orders. What the crew had to do was to constantly remember that the old captain need no longer be obeyed and learn to respond to the voice of the new captain. It's like this with us. Our old nature will keep on shouting out orders, but it's been stripped of its power. It has no authority over us. Now we can still obey it, but you don't have to. Yeah. What you must learn to do is listen to the voice of our new captain, that's Jesus, yeah. Yeah. and choose to obey him. Yeah. He and he alone is to be obeyed, for the sin nature can no longer rule our lives. We have to crucify the flesh. <laughs> but you don't realize how hard it is to resist sin. I can hear people saying it. I've been there. I know how hard it is. But look what the Bible says about it. Hebrews 12, 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. When we say, oh, you don't know how hard it is, look what the scripture says. You haven't shed blood yet for it. Let me tell you something. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus shed his blood. Not because of anything coming against, afflicting him, whips, none of that stuff. No. He shed his blood because he, he was in so much anguish. And he, and, and, and he didn't, the cross was so painful to even think about it. But yet, even though he shed his blood, he yet still walked in obedience to the Father. That's right. Yeah, I know it's painful to resist sin. I understand that. But you haven't shed your blood yet for it. And Jesus did. You have to choose obedience. So there are three things we have to die to. Just like it took three nails to crucify Christ, there are three things we have to nail to our cross. Our old mindset, selfishness, and the flesh. If any of these areas are not dealt with, then you're not fully crucified. And you're leaving a door open to Satan. God gave me an image when I was thinking about this. He gave me a visual of a man who was dying and doctors just surrounding the man. And he still had some life left in him. And the doctors were just like, come on, hit him, you know, those things. Just hit him again, hit him again. He's not dead yet. There's still life in him. We still have a chance at him. And he began to show me that's what Satan's like with us. Whatever you have not yet crucified, you're still alive. There's still a, 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 a glimmer of hope for Satan. Come on. That's the area. Right there. Attack him right there. That's his weakness. Get him. He's not dead yet. We haven't lost him yet. Come on. Jesus doesn't have him all the way. Get him. Attack right there. And he sends electricity to your heart. He knows your flesh. He knows your desires. He knows where to get you at. That's right. Come on. And the whole time God's saying, stay down, son. Just stay down. Do not give back up. Satan wants to resuscitate us. He wants us to come back to him. Stay dead. Stay down. You see, sin has no dominion over a dead man. Think about this. Think about if we had a, a, a casket in here right now. And this man who's in this casket, he's dead, right? And, and at one time, he was, he was in bondage to the worst thing you could think of. He was a slave to the most wicked thing you could think of. I don't care what addiction it is, he was a slave to it. I could take that very thing. I don't care if it was drug, alcohol, pornography, whatever it is. I could put it in front of that man, and guess what? It has no hold of him. Why? Because he's dead. Yes. Because he's dead. I don't care what you're a slave to. Your answer out is simply death. Yeah. It will have no more hold over you. Sin has no hold over a dead man. Yeah. The last thing Jesus said concerning this issue was this. Luke 14, 27-32. He says, And whoever does not carry that cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He said, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. 
Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundations and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. Saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. <clears throat> or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Only first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him, 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask the terms of peace. Jesus said there's a cost. There's a cost to following me. He said it's your cross. He said that without taking up your cross, you can't finish this thing. You can start it, but you won't finish it. Why? How many believers, they come in and start strong, but they have not yet been crucified. And that sin that so easily entangles, entangles them and they're back out in the world because they didn't put it to death. Because Satan saw a way back into that person. Jesus said, you, you, won't have, you won't be able to finish it. You'll be like a man who started out but, but didn't finish. We've got to finish the race. And the next thing he says, he says, without taking up your cross, you can't beat the opposing king. Which is who? Think about this. I read this. I can't even tell you to read this. I read this this time. He said, suppose a king, that's you, is about to go to war against another king, that's Satan. Won't you first sit down and consider whether you're able to beat him? Won't you first sit down and figure out whether or not you're going to take up your cross because if not, you can't win? Because if you're not willing to die to yourself because it costs too much and live for Christ, then you can't win this battle. Yeah. It says the man had to send the opposing king a letter. Can you imagine sending Satan a letter asking for peace? That's what you have to do. Every time somebody walks out and decides they're not following Christ no more, that's what they're doing. They're giving in to Satan. Can you imagine what that letter would look like in your life? I thought about it, and I guess it would sound something like this. Dear Satan, I started strong, and I thought I could beat you. But I didn't count the cost first. Jesus told me in order to follow him, I'd have to deny myself and be willing to lay down my life for him. And I simply love this life too much. He tells me to set my mind on eternity, but I've become nearsighted. And I'm focused on the here and now. I'm not willing to resist you anymore. The lust and the sex, the drugs and the alcohol, adultery and the fornication, the pornography, anger and hate, they're my master. So this is my letter of surrender. Sincerely yours. Sincerely Yours. Because if you're not willing to lay down your life for Jesus, then you belong to Him. Yeah. Sincerely yours. You're either going to live for Jesus and die to sin, or live for sin and die to Jesus. There's no way, there's no ands, ands, or buts about it. Can you imagine writing that letter? Surrendering. We have a choice. Either take up your cross and begin winning the fight or surrender to the enemy. I wish it was as simple as laying hands and praying on everybody in this room I would do it. But I can't lay hands and make your flesh go away. I can't make the choice for you. I can't have everybody line up here and pray for everybody because guess what? When you get home and sin knocks at your door, you have a choice. Either answer it or deny it. I can't do anything for you. All I can do is give you the scripture. You have to choose sin or righteousness. Jesus made a choice, the Bible says. It says he set his face toward Jerusalem like a flint. He, that means he was determined. He had his mind made up. I'm going to the cross. And the disciples tried to stop him. That's your flesh. 
They were acting in the flesh. That's your flesh saying, don't go to the cross. You can't lay your life down. You've got too much to lose. Get behind me, Satan. That's right. I'm going to the cross. And while he was even on the cross, I love that he set his face like a flint. That means he was just zoned in on that cross, man. While he was on the cross, the Pharisees, they were all yelling, if you are the Son of God, come off of that thing. That was, I think that was the biggest temptation he had. He was, he was feeling the pain. And yet he decided to stay up there for you and I. And there's going to be times where you're going to be resisting sin. And it's going to be painful. And it's going to hurt. And you're going to be screaming. And Satan's going to tell you, come off that thing. Come on, get out of that pain. Just give in to that sin. And you have to make a choice. I'm staying up here because the one who died for me did. We have to set our sights on our cross and determine that nothing is going to stop us because we know there's life after the cross. There's resurrection life. There's abundant life. Jim Elliott said this. He said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Sorry. Let that sink in. If you give up this life, this thing you love so much, you're not a fool. You couldn't keep it anyway. That's right. You know what you're gaining? You're gaining eternity. You can't be taken from you. That's right. That's right. You're not a fool. Give this thing up, man. Lay this life down. Don't settle for this life of sin and bondage when Jesus promised you more. Yeah. He promised you more. And it's yours for the taking. But first, you've got to lay down your life. Yeah. Chances are, if you're saved and haven't died to yourself, the sin that you're enslaved to will entangle you and choke you out before you ever make it to eternity. A lot of people say, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna continue fighting this thing all the way until I get there. What if you don't make it there? What if that sin gets so strong on you it overtakes you, it takes you from Jesus? It's time to get free. It's time to get free. You have a choice. Freedom is a choice. You have to choose freedom. You have to choose Jesus over yourself. You have got to lay down your life so he can live through you. I want Jesus living in me so much that it's as if he was walking this earth. Through me. Don't give up eternity. Surrender today. I'm here to confirm there's life after death. I was trying to figure out how I was going to end this. Like I said, I, I can't lay hands on each and every one of you and make your flesh go away. And I can't make the decision for you. You have got to make a decision. You have got to determine in your mind that you are dead to yourself. That you died. That you no longer live. That you no longer have rights to yourself. That you no longer have the right to destroy something that somebody else bought. Your body is not yours. You don't have rights to destroy it, to damage it. It belongs to Jesus. He paid for it and it's his. Stop damaging somebody else's product. So what I want to do is I want to play two songs. I have everybody stand up and look. If you made that decision, just talk to Jesus about it. Talk to God. Just say, God, I'm willing to surrender my life. And after that, we'll, we'll go. Praise the Lord. And if you have 